us. So, we are finishing this morning the the uh, book. Uh, the, excuse me, the, the first chapter of First Corinthians. So, turn in your Bibles, if you would, to First Corinthians, chapter one. We are going to be looking at verses twenty-six to thirty-one. Um, this is entitled "The People That God Chooses." Verse 26, for you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty, and the base things of the world and the things which are despised God has chosen, and the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that as it is written, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. That's a good word. I think that's my phone. Probably a telemarketer. They all seem to know where I am. I'm going to pray while that rings, and we're just going to continue on, and I'm not going to stop the, the service here. Father, thank you, Lord, that you have such a heart to call people to yourself. Thank you for that. Um, thank you that you call people to yourself that the world would never invite to be a part of their lives. But, Lord, you are a merciful and a loving God, and uh, you have pity on us. Your word declares that as a father pities his children, so you pity us, because you know that we're, our frames are just like dust, Lord. So we thank you this morning that you're a good and an inviting God and a loving God. We commit this time to you, Father. We pray in Jesus' name. Thank you. Amen. 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 I remember when I was in, in fourth, fifth, sixth grade, marbles was a big thing at school. We played marbles a lot. And um, we would play for funsies, or we would play for keepsies. And funsies meant you were gambling, but everybody got their marbles back at the end of the game. But keepsies, uh, you know, or, or keeps. Uh, if you if you you know beat somebody in marbles, you got to keep their marbles. And so, I think eventually the school outlawed it because they said it was a form of gambling. So, so I had a depressed childhood, as you you can tell. I remember the marbles. We had uh, steely marbles. They were just solid metal, you know. And um, we had uh, the clearies, which were just clear. We had the cat's eyes. We had all kinds of marbles. And one of the things that that I used to do, and a lot of us used to do, we'd um, We'd heat the marble up, like in the oven or something, and then we'd put it in ice water, and it would kind of crack. And it would kind of have a crystalline look then after that. So you'd get a cleary and heat it up and then put it in cold water, and it would crack on the inside, and then you'd hold it up, and it would be like multifaceted and our version of a diamond, you know. <laughs> but when I was a kid, if you would have offered me a diamond or, or a, one of those marbles that we kind of manipulated, I wouldn't really know much of a difference. I may or may not choose the diamond because I couldn't tell. But as an adult, obviously, now I can tell. I would choose that which is infinitely better. So we see here with the Corinthians that they were playing favorites. And we, as, as we've been studying 1 Corinthians chapter 1, we see that they were followers of people. Some followed Paul, some followed Apostle, uh, Apollo, some followed Peter. And then there was a group that said, and we follow Christ. And so there was schisms and divisions in the church. But just like me when I was a kid, not really valuing the thing that was the most valuable, Christians, we can do that sometimes too. We can start following personalities and instead of really focusing on Christ. And so this is what was happening. That's the background here that Paul is, is writing to this church. That's one of the things that we're struggling, that they were struggling with. And so he's telling them here and he's reminding them, guys, remember where you came from. You have a tendency, he would say to them, to follow personalities. But let's all remember what we were like when God found us. None of us was particularly beautiful or desirable according to worldly standards. So why are we slipping back into that mindset of thinking like the unbelieving world? Why are we doing that? And so this is a corrective a portion of the letter. There's a lot of correction in this letter. They were a marvelously gifted church. They had all the spiritual gifts. They were... Um, Paul said in knowledge, they, they, they fell behind in nothing. And if there was a lot of carnality, there was a lot of immaturity among them. And so we read in verses 26, 27, 28, 
I'll just read those verses to get us started here once again. You see your calling, brethren, not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty and the base things of the world and the things which are despised God has chosen and the things which are not to bring to nothing things that are. So let's go down our list here on your notes if you want to follow me, if, if follow along there. What was our condition and what is a, a person's condition when God calls them? He says, not many of you were mighty. He doesn't say not any of you, but he said most of you. And, you know, among this group, we might have one or two that would be considered uh, mighty and wise according to the flesh and all that. But, but probably for the most of us, if you stood us up in front of a, a bunch of CEOs or, you know, world leaders, we wouldn't be chosen for their team. That's okay. You know, we are what we are. We can only do with, you know, we can only work with what we've been given, play the cards we've been dealt. So he doesn't say not any, but he does say not many. And probably we could say most of us wouldn't be considered wise according to the flesh. I'm, you're already encouraged, aren't you? I'm just going to keep hammering away on you here till we really get your heads going down like that. So it's my job this morning. He says, you're not wise. Many of you, not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. And wise is taking the information, gathering information from the world and putting it to use. So not many of them were wise according to worldly standards. He says, not many of you were mighty, which means you were not influential or powerful over the lives of other people. You weren't an influencer. And that's kind of a new term that's, that's real popular in this online age. People say, I'm an influencer. I have a website. I have a blog. And I'm telling you how you ought to live your life. And I'm pretty or I'm handsome and I speak well. And I've got a routine down, and so I'm an influencer. And he says, not Corinthians, not many of you were like that. He says, not many of you were noble, which means you weren't well-born. You weren't high in rank. You're not part of higher society. Probably none of us has a private jet and a hangar somewhere, or a, th or a third or a fourth car, or two or three houses, or that kind of thing. We're just po folks. We're just common people. And he says, that's how you were, Corinthians, when God called you. He says, you were considered foolish, and the word means dull or absurd. You were considered foolish by the world. When God called you, Corinthians, that's how you were. That's how the world looked at you. He says, you were considered weak, which means feeble, impotent, sick, without strength. That's how you were when God called you. You were considered base, <coughs> excuse me, which means without kin, without family, unknown descent, ignoble. You didn't come from a, a blue blood kind of... Uh, background. You didn't have some great ancestry or lineage when God found you. He says, in fact, when God found you, you were despised. You were contemptible. You were least esteemed. I won't ask for a show of hands on that one. <laughs> I wouldn't have chose me if I was the Lord. Sometimes I still feel like I wouldn't choose me. But he chose me. He chose so many of us here. And he's looking for people and he's calling for people. And he doesn't use worldly standards. Aren't you glad? He doesn't use worldly standards. Despised, what a word. Contemptible. Least esteemed. Something, he says, interesting little phrase here. God has chosen the things which are not. And it means useless. Considered, somebody that's considered a nothing. That's a strong one, isn't it? In 1 Corinthians, I'm going to ask you to turn over to chapter 6, if you would. Paul has another list there. It's very, very similar. And we do well to be reminded of what he says about our condition uh, prior to coming to Christ. The Corinthians here were arguing with one another and threatening one another with lawsuits. And he's reminding them, you guys are going to be judging angels. And that's a whole other study. <laughs> But he says, why, why are you wanting to go to court before unbelieving lawyers? And so this was one of the problems. And then he says in verse 9, 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9, Don't you, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't be deceived. Now check this list out, guys. If you're not depressed yet, you will be. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. <clears throat> we could probably all find one of those categories 
or something close by that we could have assigned to our name before we came to Christ. But Paul is reminding them over and over again, you have a life in Christ now, but don't forget where you came from. But look what he says in verse 11. Such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Turn back to chapter 1, if you would, please. Chapter 1. And so here the Apostle Paul is reminding them in verse 26, 27, 28. You see your calling, brethren. Don't forget where you came from. And he's also saying this. By the way, don't the people that you're... you're uh, creating fan clubs over, the people that you are holding up as your heroes, don't forget where they came from either because they came from those categories too. That's how they were when God found them. So why are we exalting them now? Because God has done a great work in them. Praise the Lord and glory to the Lord. But why are you giving them the glory? And in fact, why are you dividing the church over these people? They did all the same kinds of sins that you did. Just because you're gift, just because they are gifted or they're, they have some outward beauty or something like that, why are we exalting them? I, hear, I remember a pastor saying years and years ago when I was just coming back to Christ, probably 1980, Debbie and I were just starting to go to church. And he said, listen, if I give you $20, why would I praise you for receiving it? It's just a gift. You've just been given something. And yet we can exalt people that have just been gifted. Praise the Lord for the gift giver. Praise the gift giver. Admire the gift, but don't praise the person. And this is what the Corinthians were falling into. And so he's just doing this to remind them, to bring them, to bring them back down to earth again, if you would. So the person's condition when God calls them, he gives us a list. And then he tells us the, the, the flip side, the positive side of things. And this might not even seem like a positive. What does God do through his children? Look at starting at verse 27. God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. Why did God choose the foolish things of the world? Open book test. To do what? To put to shame the wise. The the, the wisdom of the world, the wise people, quote unquote, of the world, will look at some of us and say, God is using that person? I wouldn't have chose that person. But But God is glorified when he uses somebody that's considered a fool by the world. Then God gets the glory. Guys, when we're watching, and I'm not trying to knock TED Talks or things like that. I I enjoy some TED Talks, if you know what those are, if not, whatever. But, you know, I enjoy listening to intelligent people speak. But there's such a tendency for us to glorify them. And there's such a tendency for some of them to receive the glory, too. But God chooses the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the mighty. Who gets the glory when a weak person does something strong. God gets the glory because we all know that person is weak. So God gets the glory. God is, and, the, and he's chosen, verse 28, the base things of the world and the things which are despised God has chosen and the things which are not. Things, people that are considered nothings to bring to nothing the things that are. God shows himself great through our weakness. And that isn't an excuse or a reason to stay weak or to, you know, just continually talk about your weakness or kind of kick the dirt and say, oh, I'm just no good, I'm a nothing, and oh, praise the Lord, he just uses a nothing like me. Well, if you do that, you're still focusing on yourself, even if it seems to be humble and negative. But God does use people that the world wouldn't say are qualified. He does use weak, he uses struggling people. I'll just share with you guys honestly. Danny, Pastor Danny asked me this morning, how are you doing? I said, I don't know why, but I'm anxious about this trip. I'm feeling some anxiety. I've been sharing it with Debbie the last two or three days. I'm not afraid. But there's just, what's going on in my mind? I don't know. I'm, you know I'm, I'm just flesh and blood like you guys. And Pastor Danny reminded me. He says, yeah, I remember Jeremiah. Danny, what was the word you used about Jeremiah? He was distressed at times too. The Apostle Paul, he said, I was with you in much... Fear and weakness and trembling. And I'm, I'm thinking, I've been traveling internationally for 30 years. Why am I kind of, and it's, I don't think it's a premonition or anything. I'm pretty sure I'll be back, you know. <laughs> but it's just, it's just funny sometimes how the Lord will just let us go through these things and then he'll use us for his glory. And when I get done with this, I'll, I'll definitely be saying, praise the Lord. Because I was kind of nervous, you know. 
And so he uses us in our weakness so that he will get the glory, not so that we will get the glory. Look at your notes, a wonderful quote by John Calvin. In putting the strong and wise and great to shame, God does not exalt the weak and uneducated and worthless, but brings everyone down to one common level. The weak and common and so-called considered considered useless already know that they're there, and the wise and the so-called strength and the so-called powerful need to realize that without God, that's where they're there at too. So he just levels the playing field in all of this. Verse 29, why does God use the foolish? Well, I've already been saying it. I'll say it again. Verse 29, that no flesh should glory in his presence. It's so easy for us. It's so easy. I'm, I'm, just, I'm probably, like many of you, just distressed over the political division in our country and, and the political division in our churches. It's just amazing to me. Guys, our citizenship is in heaven. I'm an American. But if I moved, if Debbie and I moved to Peru and became uh, Peruvian citizens, I would be a Peruvian citizen, but my citizenship is in heaven. Amen. My first allegiance is there. Amen. My second allegiance is here, but I, but I could easily change it and, and go live somewhere else and try to do well for that country as well. Mm-hmm. We all have a higher calling, mm-hmm. but the churches seem to be dividing. Uh, you know, I'm not saying it's wrong to be nationalistic to a point, but guys, as much as we would like to think of the United States as a Christian nation, it isn't. It isn't a Christian nation. It's not intended to be. The Israelites were a theocracy, that God was ruling over them both politically and, and religiously and spiritually. That's not the case with the United States. We say things like God and country, but there's not a lot of God in our country. And our government isn't even formed to be that way. There were theists and things like that and probably some Christian men, the framers of the Constitution. Oh, I'm going off on a rabbit trail here. I'm probably carrying the shovel, digging a hole, you know. But, but, uh, but the, the whole idea of nationalism and I'm for this guy and I'm for that guy. And, we're div- and my point is we're dividing the church over these things. I love this politician. I love that politician. I love this pastor. I love that pastor. I love this worship team. I love that worship team. I love these songs. I love that. It's, it's wrong. Once again, as Alistair Begg says, the best of men are men at best. And we've seen some of our leaders, every once in a while we see some leaders fall. I was watching this this video last night about some Christian leaders in Christendom, this pastor having a friendly, healthy debate with that pastor. Well, you said this and you said that, and there was other guys sitting in the background. And they were like weighing in on this this debate and kind of a, a little bit of a friendly argument and this guy of this persuasion calling out this guy in this persuasion and as i looked at the people there i go well that one has been exposed for like five million dollars in gambling debt and that one has been exposed for abusing his people in his church and this was three or four years ago but, but as with the passing of time you see these guys falling sometimes but until then they have fan clubs what's my point it's just natural for us to do that so we all need to guard ourselves to not exalt people and especially to not divide when we find ourselves loving somebody that the person next to us doesn't love. It's a very dangerous thing, and it's very natural. And that's why Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is reminding everybody, guys, this is where you came from. By the way, this is where they came from. Let's glory in the Lord. If he's using anybody, praise the Lord. He doesn't need to use us, but he chooses to use us, and it's an amazing thing. Amen. Why does God use the foolish? So that he will get the glory. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 6. We are warned against pride. Paul's telling Timothy, when you choose pastors, when you choose leaders, don't choose a novice, Timothy. Don't choose a new believer, lest being puffed up with pride, you fall into the same condemnation as the devil. It's very easy for us to be proud. It's very easy for us to be proud about the people we follow. Pride is the sin that was committed by Satan. Look at Isaiah chapter 14. How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground. You who weaken the nations, for you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Yet you shall be brought down to Sheol to the lowest depths of the pit. Pride is what turned Lucifer, if you will, into Satan. Pride is what got him removed. And and. It's something that we all have to be very, very careful with. Guys, I really want to encourage you. Even with things like 
feeling like, well, nobody said thank you. Well, they probably should, but you know what? The Lord saw. He's a rewarder of those who diligently serve him. Isn't that enough? The Lord saw. We don't have to get pats on the back all the time. It's good to encourage one another. It's good to thank one another. But if you start to get a little bit kind of, you know, rough around the edges because you're not getting thanked all the time, you just need to consider that. Why? Do I want to be noticed? It's really easy for us. It's really easy for all of us. People like to glory in other people. I've already talked about that. The glorying in man was leading to visions among the, the Corinthians. And God will seek to undo our glory because he loves us. The Bible, the old King James uses the word vain glory. The glory that is vain. <laughs> it's useless. Psalm 18 verse 30, as for God, his way is perfect. Not my way and not your way. His way is perfect. The word of the Lord is proven. He is a shield to all who trust him. Proud people have trouble with that. They want the focus on them. And it's really easy for us too, guys. Here's another thing. I think it's really easy for us to live vicariously through the lives of our heroes, isn't it? One of the, one of the kind of the typical or, or a, rep, a repetitive theme of certain kind of movies is you see a young boy, perhaps, a teenage boy, who's a gifted athlete, and he enjoys sports and everything, and he's, he has a degree of success, but dad is pushing, 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 pushing so hard because the boy is probably going to be more successful than the dad ever was at sports, but dad is living vicariously through the son. So he's pushing the son. And a lot of times we love to see our, our Christian leaders win an argument, or we love to see our Christian musicians get voted for a double award. Uh, or, or, you know, we love, we, you know, anyway, you guys know what I'm saying. We love to see our team get the exaltation because then we get the exaltation vicariously. It kind of, it kind of, you know, flows down to us a little bit. It trickles down to us. We need to be careful about those things. God, God should get the glory. I'm, I'm sure that everybody in here agrees with that. Let's go back to verse 28. My target verse is 30, but just for the flow, I love the way that the Apostle Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, builds this momentum. He builds this argument. He's, he's like, a, he's like a, a prosecuting attorney just really making his point. It's not just emotion. It's, it's reasonable to think about these things. He's not just pointing a finger at the Corinthians. He's not just saying stop it, but he's showing them the foolishness of what they were doing. And I love how the Bible causes us to, 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 to take in the facts and how God wants to reason with us. Verse the base things of the world, verse 28, and the things which are despised God has chosen and the things which are not, the people which are considered useless. He chooses these to bring to nothing the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. Now he pivots in verse 30, but of him you are in Christ Jesus. Does anybody have the New International Version here? Does anybody have that? Yeah, can you read it, Angel, really loudly? Verse 30. Were you looking at Facebook? <laughs> oh, okay, spank me. I was mean. That's okay. Right, we can stop there. Thank you. Thanks for letting me pick on you in fun. I like the way that the NIV says that. It is because of him. Let, let me paraphrase. In fact, can you read the rest of that verse again? Angel, can you? <laughs> we are totally off script here. Can you read verse 30? All of verse 30. Okay. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God, that is, the righteousness of God, and sanctification and redemption. Thank you. It is because of him. It isn't because of Apollos or Peter or Paul. It isn't because of any person. It is because of him. Isn't that great? Yes. It's, it's, a, it's a recalibration. It's a reset. It's a reboot in the way that they were thinking. 
But of him, verse 30 in the New King James, but of him you are in Christ Jesus. Now notice what Jesus has become and is for us. He became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Let's look at your notes. Our salvation, guys, originates with God. It doesn't originate with man. I know that we all know that. Man does not have the power to save himself from his sins or from God's judgment for our sins. To try to save yourself from your sins means you try to transform your own nature. You try to, by your own human strength to conquer your sin nature. You might be able to have some behavior modification, but you can't change a lion, you know, a, a, a cheetah, if you will, leopard can't change his spots. He's always going to be a leopard. He might get, a, you know, he might get dyed uh, black or even pink, so he looks like Pink Panther or something like that. But he's still a leopard. He can try to transform himself, but he can't. Only God can transform a life. So God saves us from the power and dominion of our sins and the judgment, the penalty because of our sins. What does the Bible tell us? Hebrews 12, 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, not looking unto Paul or Cephas or Apollos or this pastor or that singer or this bishop or whoever, looking unto Jesus. Our salvation originates with God. Verse 30, but of him, because of him, you are in Christ Jesus who became for us wisdom from God. Jesus became or manifested, if you will, the wisdom of God. What is the wisdom of God towards you? Look at Jesus. Jesus, in his obedience to the Father, manifested the plan of salvation for mankind. So if you want to say, I want to know about the wisdom of God, the first place we look is at Jesus, because he is the outworking, he is the tool, he is the instrument, he is the manifestation of God's wisdom. Uh, I have a cool little microphone up here, it's called a Rode NT1A Mini. Isn't that cute? I feel really important having this here. This makes me feel very credible. I just wanted you guys, maybe we'll set it up there for the Facebook. See, I feel like, like a broadcaster, right? I'm being silly with you guys. Yeah. <laughs> Did this mic, is this mic wise or is it the manifestation of wisdom? It's the manifestation of wisdom. Somebody collected a bunch of information about how to wire things together and how to create a, uh, a diaphragm in there to receive the, the, uh, the vibrations, the sonic vibrations from my voice, how to transmit that into electrical impulses so that it goes into my computer. This is a manifestation of somebody's wisdom. Jesus is the manifestation of the wisdom of God, the multifaceted manifestation of the wisdom of God. And what was, what was manifested uh, with Jesus regarding the wisdom of God. But of him you are in Christ Jesus, which speaks first of all of our justification. It speaks also of our righteousness. It speaks also of our sanctification. It speaks also of our redemption. Jesus accomplished all those things. Look at your notes there, letter B. Jesus became wisdom for us. Jesus lived out the wisdom of the Father's plan. 1 Corinthians 2, 5, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. The wisdom of men would be self-help. The wisdom of men would buy, be by this book or by that book. One of the things that I'm going to share with the Santitos next week is, is a, a study called self-helpism. And self-helpism is very popular in our country. It's estimated by, that, by the year 2022, by next year, the industry will be worth, ready for this, $13.2 billion dollars. In book sales, conferences, seminars, all these things, $13.2 billion. Why that much? Because people realize that they need help. Because people want to change. They look at their lives and saying, I'm doing things that I wish I didn't, and I'm not doing the things I wish I did. I need to change. And so, that, I mean, that's wonderful that people recognize they need to change. But the wisdom of God is, surrender and I'll change you. Now, I'm not saying we can't learn some things from a TED Talk or having a personal coach about, uh, you know, nutrition or things like that. Absolutely. But those things can only change behavior. They can't change nature. And so we are transformed. And so God's plan of salvation for us is not to rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God, who is Jesus Christ. Paul talks again about Jesus became righteousness for us. 
It is in his righteousness that we stand before God. 2 Corinthians 5.21 The Father made the Son, he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. And a better, a better translation for that is he made him a sin offering for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And so when I stand, when you stand, every Christian, when we stand before God, oh my goodness, this is such a relief, isn't it? The Father sees the righteousness of Jesus, not me. Thank you. <laughs> the Father sees the righteousness of Jesus. It's assigned to me. It's credited to me. It's put to my account. And that's the wisdom of God. If I'm glorying in people, then people are going to look at the person that I'm glorying in, look for weak spots, disqualify them, and then disqualify me when he fails. And then I'll feel like a failure. And that's a trickle-down effect. But I have, the, I have the righteousness of Jesus Christ who lives a perfect life. It's assigned to me by faith. I receive it by faith. I hope everybody here has received it by faith. Jesus became sanctification for us. It is Jesus in me, in you, that brings increasing holiness. Hebrews 13, 12. Therefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered outside the gate, speaking of his crucifixion. The word sanctification means to set apart for holy purposes. Sanctification, the way that I'm going to describe it, is twofold. There is the initial sanctification which means God is taking me from the, 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 uh, the category of sinner, uh, judged sinner to forgiven saint, and so I'm set apart that way, and then there is an ongoing sanctification that happens in my life, a setting apart, the changing of my mind, the, ch the changing of my attitudes. And that's part of the wisdom of God. If you're following Paul, he can tell you what to do, but he doesn't have the power to change you. If you're following Apollos, if you're following Cephas, they can tell you what to do, but they don't have the power to change you. Only God has the power to change you, to, to make that ongoing sanctification happen in your life. God will use people. God will use books. God will use teaching. He'll use YouTube videos. He'll use a conference. But he's, he's the fountainhead. He's the source. Everybody else is just like a, a stream from which that information, that power flows, flows through. And then finally, Paul says, verse 30, but because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God. Jesus became righteousness for us. Jesus became and still is sanctification for us. And Jesus became redemption for us. The word redemption, guys, when you read it in the New Testament, it speaks of buying a slave out of the slave market. It's saying, I want that person there. They are there, maybe by their own fault, or maybe somebody enslaved them, but they don't have the ability to get themselves out of that situation. I will come and pay for them with my own resources, and I will, I will bring them to myself. And so there's three different words in the Greek that, that's, that speak of that. I don't remember what they are right now. But one is to buy a slave out of the slave market. The other one is to buy a slave out of the slave market and never sell him again. And there's another one that says to buy a slave out of the slave market and set him free to be his own person. And that means that the, per the thing that was dominating that person's life is broken. They are redeemed and they have a new master. Look at the, look at the notes here, John 8, 34 to 36. Jesus answered them and said, Most assuredly, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. A slave does not abide in the house forever. Slaves could be bought and sold. In the first century, if you were a slave, you had no, you had no permanent residency. It was at the whim of the master. He could sell you any time. You had no security. You weren't written into the will. You weren't part of the family. You were just property. You were just used. Slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the Son makes you, be, makes you free, you'll be free indeed. When we are in Christ, the dominion of the, of, the, of the tyranny of sin is broken in our lives. Can we go, you know, fool around with it again? Sure. Can we, can, we, can we act like a slave for a while? Yeah, but we don't have to. We don't have to. The power has been broken. The slavery and dominion of sin has been broken. 
and the penalty for our sins has been forgiven. What's the application? Every time after a sermon, every time after you hear some kind of teaching, and we're going to practice this together just for fun, because I like to have fun, you should say, yeah, so what? So on three, one, two, three. So what? So what? I'm impressed, Pastor Bill. Wow. Lots of good information. That's my dumb, dumb voice. Hey, boo boo. So what? So if this is all true, if this is all true, that we were a mess and just despicable and useless in the eyes of so many people when God found us, but he chose us anyway, so that when he does anything good through us, he gets the glory. And then if we are exalting people that we think are wise and wonderful, and we're overlooking Jesus, he brings our focus back onto Jesus. He, he, he says, you want to know what real wisdom is? It's not Apollos from Alexandria who has flowery speech. The real wisdom of God is Jesus Christ. He's your sanctification. He's your redemption. He's your justification. That's the wisdom of God. Look there. So the reason that Paul is telling us all these things, let's look at the notes as we finish up here. What are these things, what is the result of realizing these things? Number one, we have six things. It gives hope to every person who doesn't know Jesus. For some groups, you have to have a certain financial statement or you have to have a certain you know, pedigree or you have to have a certain level of education to, to be a part of this group. God will take anybody. <laughs> He'll take anybody. And remember what we read in 1 Corinthians 6, and such were some of you. We were some of those people. God is pleased to choose any man or woman to be his child. So it gives hope to everyone who doesn't know Christ. Number two, it destroys the wrong thinking of God about only choosing winners. God is, loves the entirety of humanity. The gospel is open to all people. Jesus said to the woman at the well, the woman at the well, John 4, was a very promiscuous woman. She had had five husbands before, and the man she was living with was not her husband. But Jesus said to her, whoever drinks this water, this physical water, will thirst again. Whoever drinks of the water I shall give him will never thirst for anything else. Once you've tasted the water of Jesus, he is the only thing that satisfies. You might go sample some other wells or something, but you see it's just bitter water. The water I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. And so he's saying this to a promiscuous, immoral woman. So God doesn't choose what the world would say are winners. Number three, these, this, these truths tells the Christian not to glory in himself or in others when considering the standards of the world. Don't, don't follow people. Respect them, appreciate them, even admire them, but don't glorify them. Especially to the degree where you find yourself breaking away from other people. Guys, can I just, I really have to pound it home, I think. Watch out for this politics stuff. Watch out, it's dividing the church. Have strong opinions. But if you find yourself seeing somebody at church and oh, there's that person that follows so-and-so, I'll wait till they're out of the donut room before I get my donut. Maybe I should go first to get the good donut. Yeah, I mean, we laugh, we laugh, but it's, it's true. I haven't seen that here. But we're all just humans, and, I, and we see it, don't we? We see these things happening. Have your opinions about politics. Vote biblically. But, but the kingdom of God is much higher than the, than, than the kingdoms and governments of man. He shall reign forever and ever. The Lord omnipotent. He shall reign. We are one in him. So when we, when we realize these things, we prevent divisions and cliques in the church. Let's not ever allow cliques or divisions to come in to our church. Realizing these things tells us we don't have to try to earn God's approval by being as good as someone else. As one, as one commentator of old said, it's a soft pillow for a tired head. If we're looking at other people and, gee, I wish I could be like Apollos. Maybe I should vacation in Alexandria, Egypt for a while. But I, don't, I, may, I need to have a start to a Kickstarter to raise the money to go to Alexandria, Egypt, so I can just hang out and get their accent and so I can sound eloquent like him and I'll never be like him. You're not supposed to be like him. It's so easy for us to compare ourselves to other people. So knowing, guys, that, that God chooses the base 
the nothings, the foolish, the despised. It gives us emotional, mental, mental, psychological stability since we know we are saved through faith, not by works. And it's something we all have to fight. Guys, I, you know, I, I share these things as one who in the past, sadly, was very worried about what people thought of me and thought I, you know, I always compared myself to people and felt like a loser all the time. This is, you gotta look up here for a minute. This is what I would do all the time. That's just me, I'm a loser. And then, this, then you got, if you're not looking up here, you gotta look up here, this is really good. I'm a loser around the world. I'm a three-dimensional loser. And it's just so easy to feel that way. Sometimes, isn't it? But if God is for me, who can be against me? If God chose me, who am I to tell him that he made a mistake? He did make a mistake. I appreciate that God chose me. I appreciate that God called me. I really do. Knowing these things, it keeps us humble and thankful. And knowing these things, read verse 31 with me if you would, that nice and loud, that as it is written, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. Say it together loudly. He who glories, let him glory in the Lord. Knowing these things, it'll push our, and direct our glory right back to God. I feel like there's so much more I want to say about this, but I, I honestly just don't know what else to say. I want us, and God wants us, to be released from this crazy mentality that we can get. You know, I'm, I'm sure some of us in this room from a very early age were told that we were no good or nothing or you'll never amount to anything or you're an idiot or that those things happen. It's, it's tragic that it happens. And we start believing it and we develop, you know, we can start developing uh, self-defense mechanisms at a very early age or we can start believing lies at a very early age. Guys, we need to be transformed by the renewing of our minds, don't we? So the Apostle Paul, you know, and we can even say, I'm no good, but if I follow him, at least I'm on the right team. And then we start glorifying people, following people, and forgetting about Jesus. Jesus is the wisdom of God. Jesus is the sanctification, the redemption, the justification. He's the plan of God. God uses people. Admire them, respect them, appreciate them. But he who glories... Let him glory in the Lord. Amen? Amen. Yeah, let's pray together, guys. Let's just sit, sit before the Lord for a minute, if, if we could. Thank you. Lord, we're very grateful that whom you set free is free indeed. And we want to walk in all the freedom, Jesus, that you died to grant to us not only freedom from the penalty of sin, the eternal judgment, the holy judgment of God, but also from the effects of sin. Effects of sin that other people have put on us and effects of sin that we've brought upon ourselves. Times that we've been slow to believe you about who you are, about who we are. Times that we are tempted to compare ourselves to others. God, save us from that, Lord. Forgive us from that. for that. Times that we want to attach ourselves to groups and make that our identity. Our identity is in you. We are your sons and daughters, Lord. Father, we pray for any here today that have not said yes to you, that they would say yes to you. That before they leave here, they'd find one of us and pray and say, yes, I want to follow Jesus. So, Lord, thank you. To you be the glory at Calvary Chapel Vallejo. To you be the glory. Uh, wherever your people gather, God. Father, I pray your blessings over this church as I'm gone for a time. Keep them safe. Keep me safe. Bring us back together, Lord. Pray in Jesus' name.